it was pretty much assumed for a very long time that my mother would inherit my house because she was the last in that that line. So we sort of figured, well, this is going to be pretty good. And my great aunt finally died in 1993 um, when she was uh, she was born in, in uh, 1897. So she was a hair short of her 98th birthday. And uh, so my mother inherited it, and my parents moved down here pretty soon. It was sometime in the late 50s that they sat down with my great aunt and her husband and talked about the future of Y House. And the idea was that would my mother be willing to to take this on. And my father would always say, well, her husband, Morgan Schiller, said the farming operation will pay for the upkeep of the house. Yeah. And my father would say, well, if you believe that, you also believe in the tooth fairy. Our family prayer is, oh God, don't let me be the one to lose the place. After the property was acquired in 1659, so been around, and it's been close many times. You know, after 300 years plus, somebody's got to get this done, and you know we're willing to do that, and we don't regret it. I've always liked history, and my mother loved history, and my father loved history, and it's sort of something I grew up with. You know, when you come from a family like ours, it's pretty natural to be interested in history. And not long after we came down here, um, I went on the board of the Historical Society, local Historical Society, and we were doing a lot of strategic planning. And one of the things we were talking about was how can we link ourselves better with other similarly situated organizations. We set up a meeting with the Maritime Museum, which, as I say, had, was an outgrowth. Mm -hmm. It was actually started by the Historical Society. And I set up a meeting with a couple of board members that I knew and their then executive director to talk about how could we do more stuff together and stop all these charities and down here seem to sort of battle each other for for money and and yeah. guests and blah 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 and so somebody said well Tillman why don't you go on the board and maybe we can you know sort of start working on this initiative you know once you get on a board if you aren't careful if you actually act interested and you show up and you ask questions and you give them a little money blah 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 you find you're you're going to move up through the organization because by sort of by default. So I was dumb enough to actually participate in everything else. And long story short, I found myself. You know, they said, "Would you be willing to be a vice president? And would you be willing to do this?" And you know, I'm not very good at saying no to yeah. organizations yeah. that are important. In the modern world, there are a lot of challenges for those who are involved in this tide water way of life. We've got all of these ecological problems. We've got the bay pollution. We've got rising tides, you know, and all of this stuff. But there's another challenge that a lot of people don't stop and think about. And that is the fact that there's a whole way of life that has or is rapidly disappearing. And that is the way of life of the watermen and just the, the, the people who have lived here, not the ones that came recently and built a fancy boat dock and put an expensive boat at the end of the dock. But that whole way of life, the packing plants, the, the watermen, the, you know, this, that, and the other thing, that, as my grandmother or great-grandmother would have said, began to disappear when they built that damn bridge. And 
it's important that we remember that way of life and the way of life of the old wooden boats. Nobody builds wooden boats anymore and they're all out of fiber class, but you know, we're trying to preserve the old ways, the 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 sailboats, the skipjacks, the log canoes, the by boats, all of that stuff. So people will continue to have, hopefully, an understanding of way the way life was on the eastern shore before the dam break. Well, great challenge in in particularly in museums today, and this is a topic about which people write books. But the old quote unquote old fashioned museum getting people to come bring their families and experience whatever they experience the, you know that that museum attendance over the last 25 or 30 years has declined so some would say the glory days of these museums was 20 30 40 years ago so the challenge today is how do you present something that it will attract a parent in the sense of saying I want my children to experience that instead of spending all day in front of a TV screen or playing video games that that's pretty hard and not only do how do we get the parent to say that's what I wanted to do, but you got to get the kid to want to come and when they get there to have a really good time. Yeah. Right. Um, you if, feel the like an, you... if the answer to that question were simple, museums across the country would be thriving. You go to the Air and Space Museum at the Smithsonian in Washington, you could see the epitome of how do you engage children. Because museum attendance, leaving aside some of the finest of the fine art museums, museum attendance is integrally related to parents bringing their children. I think our big picture strategy is we got to get them on the water. We got them to we got to get them to want to be on the water. We want to take a lot of these kids that don't didn't grow up in boats like I did. I mean, most people that grew up in Talbot County or Queen Anne's or Dorchester or any of the other parts of this area, these, these people almost all grew up in boats. Mm -hmm. You know, the father was a waterman or they were weekend boaters or this or that. So everybody, you know, were, in, were involved in boats and they loved it. But today that's just not the case. Yeah. So we gotta, we got to provide them with the opportunity to experience boats. I, I would say compared to Baltimore, racism is a bigger, still a bigger problem here. Um, I think this effort that the Frederick Douglass Honor Society has embarked upon with people like Eric and Harriet Lowry and, and the work that uh, is being done on the Hill with the um, Dale Green and people like that. I think we're making progress down here, but we still have a race relations problem. There's no question about that. And uh, when you look at how much energy had to go into getting that Frederick Douglass statue in front of the courthouse, um, my mother was the only white person on the Frederick Douglass Honor Society board that ultimately got that done and uh, you know she was uh, she died in 1912 at, at, at 19, 2012 at the age of 93 and during the late 80s when most of this was going on she was pretty discouraged and she used to like to say you know when I grew up down here the relationship that we had with the black people was something that is almost hard to understand. But we had a we had a close, loving relationship. In 1881, 
Frederick Douglass came back to the Eastern Shore and came to visit at Y House, where he had been, had lived as a, between the ages of six and nine. And he came up to the house and he was greeted by my great grandfather and they sat on the back porch. And the newspaper reports say they drank tea. And everybody in the family would say, Charles Howard Lord never, Lloyd never had a glass of tea in his life. They were drinking mint juleps. <laughs> Let me tell you how bad it was. The, that was on a weekend. T uh, three days into the following week, he got a letter from the Chesapeake Bay Yacht Club saying, we would expect you to resign oh. for having entertained a black man in his house. And I think it was about then that the Lloyd family began this decades-long effort to, to work on this problem. And my mother went to her grave saying, we've come a long way, but we got a long way to go. <laughs>